Um, well, my name is Jani Martin, and um, I've had Boston Terriers since um, about 2006. Um, prior to that, I actually uh, trained and showed horses, uh, and we had a couple of boxers over the years, um, you know, a couple of mixed breeds. Um, but when uh, when we moved, we ended up uh, placing all of our horses, and then eventually when we got our own house uh you know we wanted to get a family dog and the boston was it was just kind of a no-brainer because my husband's parents had raised bostons for a while i mean they were they were just pets unregistered you know but um he really liked the breed i really liked the breed um and we had little kids so boxers were a little bit um were a little bit big and rough for them uh, you know they kind of knock them over in all their exuberance and though i loved the breed it was it was a little bit too much for having little kids running around um so when we did decide to get a dog we didn't go back to the boxer we went to um, the boston terrier and uh since i had uh, done a lot of uh training and showing in the past I did want to eventually get into showing dogs and I started out just uh, on my own and I didn't have a mentor or anything, which, you know, was not the most ideal way to start. And so I just picked out some dogs that I thought were cute. You know, I, I, I liked their heads or I, you know, I thought they just had a cute look to them. And so that's how I originally got my females. So, you know, they're just kind of backyard bred, um, uh, girls and and um, I was fortunate enough to um, uh, be able to breed to a local stud that was showing uh, and that gal took me to my first shows and you know kind of taught me a little bit about how the show ring worked and, and of course I liked that um, that kind of went right along with what I did before with horses and so I was I was hooked but I had little kids at the time so um uh, so I just showed a little bit here and there locally. Um, and then after after a while, I, I bred um, my girls for a little bit, never got anything, you know, overly fantastic. Um, I wanted to get more into show lines that I had. Um, Marsha Terry from DMAR Bonds, I talked with her, and she looked at my website, and she looked at my pedigrees, and she looked at what I had. And she was very blunt, very honest, and, you know, I am – deeply grateful that she was because she said you're the girls that you have have nothing to offer the breed um as far as pedigree you know they they really don't have anything to offer and and um you know i wanted to i wanted to do well i i wanted to have nice dogs i wanted to show and i wanted to do right uh, by the breed so although at first i was a little resistant and a little bit hurt because of course that you know everybody loves their dogs they think they're the most beautiful things in the world and and i thought i'd done a good job picking them out but i really didn't know you know confirmation or anything yet so you know over the course of the next few months i i gradually placed them and and she was very um generous and very trusting with me and and placed a very nice well-bred um little female puppy with me that um, she had a smudgy nose, so she couldn't show, but she was, you know, well put together, very well bred, and um, she was part of my foundation. Um, and when I had bred out uh, one of my other girls to this this nice local stud that had been showing, I did get a nice female back that I had held back, um, and that ended up being one of my first uh, show dogs. And she actually ended up being one of my foundation dogs as well um and I, I kind of built from her um as well as this other one that Marsha had placed with me um I eventually was able to um get two champion uh Boston studs one was um more my foundation than the other um I didn't hold back as as uh much uh, pedigree wise from the other stud but I, I did hold back um, a really nice uh, son of the first one and, and that was that was basically my foundation from there I started really getting into um, showing and, and um, of course health testing you know uh, Marsha when she sent that um, that puppy to me she had already had her eye test done she'd already had a preliminary patella check done she'd already had her bear test done um, parents were JHC negative so that gave me a very good example and a very good you know um, 
a foundation and, and something to follow, you know, from moving forward as far as what I did with my own dog. So, um, I was, I was very thankful, first of all, for her to give me the trust that she did because it was very hard to find nowadays. Um, a lot of people breeding for the wrong reasons and it's, um, it's a little bit scary placing your lines with people that you don't know. So I really appreciated that, that trust that she gave me and, and, um, the bloodlines that she entrusted me with as well as the example of, of doing the right health testing right from the start. Um, I mean, that, that's kind of my, um, my start in the breed. I've, you know, I've done quite a bit since then as far as, um, showing and really getting involved in the education piece and, and, um, uh, being involved in some of the, the issues with the breed, such as color breeding and, and with, uh, a lot of the uh, misconceptions about the breed, you know, I, I do a lot of online educating and, and um, you know, correcting of misinformation and, um, you know, that's, that's an ongoing thing because, of course, there's always stuff floating around that's incorrect. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, once, once a couple of people say something online, um, then it becomes fact. You, you say it in a big enough uh, forum and um, then all of a sudden it's, it's, law you know as far as some people are concerned so that's that's always a battle you know trying to uh, get the right information out so that people have the you know accurate view of the breed what it's supposed to be what its uh, history is and all of that so um it's an ongoing thing could you talk about the history oh yeah absolutely um the boston is it's a they have a pretty cool history because you know being the first breed that was created in America, you know, at the very beginning when AKC was first getting going, um, it was kind of the first of its kind to, you know, be bred in the U S and, and kind of the first created breed to be accepted. Everything else was established and imported from overseas. And so this was, this was a very new thing. And, and, uh, honestly, the, the purebred breeders at the time that were, you know, importing their dogs, the, the English Bulldogs and and um, uh, the Bull Terriers and, you know, the, the dogs that actually went into the breed, those that were the preservation breeder, uh, breeders of those dogs, you know, considered the, the Boston Terrier mongrel. You know, mm-hmm. they were just disgusted that they were creating this new breed and, and um, that they were going to be accepted. Um, so it was, um, it was pretty interesting. Um, it started about... 1965 when um a dog was imported called judge and he was he was called uh hooper's judge because it was robert hooper that had um that owned him and he was a little bit more bulldog type he was um about 32 pounds he was uh, like a dark brindle um and he is basically the the foundation um, of the breed um they began breeding him to um other you know, Bulldog uh, and uh, English Terrier crosses. That was really big at the time, was the English Bulldog and the English Terrier. Um, You know, the the Bull Terriers were were really big. Um, They were mainly used for, um, you know, like pit fighting and stuff like that. That was, of course, was huge at the time. Um, And in fact, um, Judge said that his his sire was, was a really, you know, big time fighting dog. Um, the Boston itself was never bred for fighting. It was, that was never supposed to be the purpose. You know, there may have been people, you know, fighting them, you know, in their barns or, you know, they, they may have been breeding for that purpose, but as far as, as what the, the written standard is, as far as what the creators of the breed had, you know, um, set the dog up to do, it was never to be a fighting dog, but of course that was big at the time. So the foundation dogs originally, um, may have had those, you know, that background, but, um, so they began, um, breeding and doing a lot of inbreeding, um, with judge. And, um, from there they began bringing in imports to, to bring the size down. A lot of people think that the Boston, was this, you know, 40, 50 pound dog, but actually, you know, Hooper's judge was one of the, 
the smallest. He was about 32 pounds. Um, and they bred him to smaller bitches from there. So, you know, like 20, 28, 22. Those were some of the first ones that he was bred to. And then they wanted to bring the size down even more. So they did import some dogs um, with, you know, they were they were more terrier type. They're a little bit smaller. Um, and, you know, those dogs ranged from, you know, like, 12 pounds to to around 20 pounds and so they they bred them down a bit more um and then from there they they um developed the um developed the registry in i think it was 1890 that they got together and decided hey we're, we're not getting recognition in the rings they they weren't really um some of them would go in and show with the bull terriers um eventually 1888 they had um a class, the round-headed bull terrier, where they could actually, you know, show the the Boston Terrier in, which was not called the Boston Terrier at the time; they were called the Roundheads or um, or American Bull Terrier. And um, so they weren't getting much recognition. The judges really would look at them when they were in with the other bull terriers. Um, so they were finally getting their own class. They finally, did, you know, they were uh, pushing towards getting the breed accepted around 1890. Um, and at first they wanted to call it the American Bull Terrier. Um, and that was too close to, you know, the other Bull Terriers in, in name. And they were originating in Boston. So, you know, they, they settled on the Boston Terrier. Um, and in 1893 is when they were first accepted. Um, and, you know, from there, they, they really took off. And, um, you know, was, you know, the all American breed, the American gentleman, of course, is their nickname. And, and I think part of it was, you know, we talk in the old history books about how rather than the big kennels kind of monopolizing the show ring success, because this was a like a new breed, a, a small breeder, you know, a, a backyard breeder, anybody could be successful at it because they hadn't nailed down the consistency yet. There wasn't, you couldn't go out and buy all the top dogs and just, you know, monopolize it and get all the top winnings. Was, you know, people that were just breeding in their backyards were getting nice dogs as well that, that um, were good representatives. And so it was something that um, anybody could be successful at. And, and there weren't imports because it was an American breed. So, um, you know, it was, it was something that, you know, just hobby breeders could get involved in. And um, so, you know, that made it really popular. And of course it's, it grew from there. I mean, everybody, everybody's grandparent had a Boston at one time. It seems like mm -hmm. you take a Boston anywhere and, and they're going to say, Oh yeah, my grandma had one. My grandpa had one. And they, they, you know, they called them the Boston bulls, you know, I know it's a, a nickname that they used a lot in, in the early days, but um, it seems like, you know, everybody used to have a Boston terrier. It was, it was such a, a popular breed and, and they really, um, they really did a good job within, I would say about 20 years or so getting the look that they were going for, you know, everybody refers to the first Boston's back from, you know, the night of the 1860s or 1870s and saying, well, you know, this is what the original dog looked or the original Boston looked like, but it was kind of a mishmash at start. So you had a lot of different types of dogs that were put into the breed. And then for the next 20 years, they were trying to breed the dog to fit the standard or fit, fit the vision that they had and so when you look at the dogs from the 1920s they look nothing like the original dogs now they've got this you know this nice sharp looking show dog with this neat clean head with the short nose and, and the cropped ears and and you know nice little square smart looking dog you know is, is what they ended up with and they did that pretty quickly um and it's it's remained fairly consistent, although, you know, the nose in some cases is a little shorter. I still see Bostons that look like, you know, they could compete in the 20s. I, I look at some of these old pictures of the some of the first show Bostons, and they're very much resembling what we've got in the ring today. You know, if you've got some extremes, but you also have, you know, Bostons are a little bit more moderate as, as far as the Brackies go. Um, and they've they changed the standard very, very little over the years, which is nice. They, they, um, the BTCA really preserves the original vision of the Boston, I feel, um, and doesn't just, you know, go with the trends or go with, you know, what a few people in the club would like it to, 
switch to, you know, they're, they're very, very careful about not changing the standard or, you know, not altering anything from that original um, vision of, of the breed. Yes, um, the, the standard is, um, the Boston Terrier is a, a series of squares. Um, it's, a, it's supposed to be a, a square dog with a square head, with a square muzzle. It's, it's um, somebody had commented on it being a box on a box on a box. You've got, you've got a, a square dog with a square head and a square muzzle within that. Um, and, and that is that sums up a lot of it. Um, it's a, it's a balanced little dog. It's not a dog, um, of extremes. They're not way over angulated. They're not, there's nothing really exaggerated about them. They're just a nice, neat, um, you know, little dog, very balanced, um, moving with a, with a nice free shoulder. Um, they're very much a head breed. Uh, one of the biggest, um, uh, characteristics of a Boston is the big round dark eyes. Um, they, what do they call it? The, um, the God love you expression expression. Is that what it is? Um, anyway, I probably got that wrong, but, um, it is the big round dark eyes. It's, it's the, the intelligence and, um, and, and they're a lively little dog. You know, that's one thing that the standard says. It's, you know, it's a lively breed. And they are. They're, they're clowns. They're fun. Um, uh, their personality is a lot of the standard. Um, you know, they're, they're not afraid of, um, not afraid of things. They're not shy. They're not, they're confident, but they're not aggressive. Um, they'll, you know, curl up with you on the couch and then they'll run and play ball, you know, the next minute. So, you know, it's a very good all around family dog. Um, but, uh, um, you know, in general, it's, it stayed very much the same. Um, as, as far as the standard goes over the years, the nose has always said that the nose is short. Um, the muzzle is short. Um, the muzzle is square and that that quite honestly that's going to give more room for a good bite for more room for teeth um you know you you uh um you look at the muzzle and in it, it's interesting you'll you'll get some that'll be a little bit longer and you end up with with the underbites you end up with crowded teeth you have that nice square muzzle and you're you're going to have more room for teeth you're going to get the better bites there's, there's a lot of things that go into the head that are going to um just give you a better dog all around um in general just the the angles the the balance all of it gives you a nice um i don't I, they're not a performance dog. They're not a working dog, but they're still an athletic dog. Um, they have, they tend to have less breathing problems than some of the more extreme dogs. I know they, they get lumped into the bracky category like a, like a lot of dogs do. Um, but, you know, kind of like the chin and the affin pincher, they don't typically have the same issues with BOAS that some of the more extreme breeds do. And, you know, and, and even in those breeds, the well-bred dogs, um, can be athletic as well. So the, the Boston tends to suffer from BOAS a lot um, less than some of the other breeds. And I think part of that is um, um, is that they've got a cleaner neck. They're, they're not as thick as some of the other breeds, and that, that definitely does help the airways as well. And I've probably gone down a completely different rabbit trail, but I'm no, <laughs> thinking of all the different aspects of the breed, and, and that just what comes that's what comes to mind as far as the positives. Yeah. No, that's perfect. Um, the height, they don't really, although it's, it's interesting, you go into the AKC website and they're going to list, they, they list a specific height. However, as far as the standard goes, there's no height. Um, there's three weight categories. There's under 15 pounds and that go down to, there's no minimum. However, once you start getting down to small, you lose the bone. And so you're starting to get these little refined spindly dogs and they start to move out of standard if they get too small. So if you've got a 12 pound dog, it should still be substantial enough that it's not this little spindly thing. It should, it should still have good bone and it should still um, be in proportion, you know, 
and the the same um I can't see the same bone as a 16 pound dog, but it, but it should be proportioned like a 16 pound dog would be. So you've got under 15 pounds with no minimum, but they still need to maintain that type. Um, and then you've got uh, 15 to 20, and then you've got 20 to 25. So there's the three different weight categories and, and there's no, um, there's no height as far as that goes. But if a dog is going to if a dog is correct, it's square, you know, for a Boston, it's going to be square. So the height doesn't matter as long as your dog is in proportion and, and is square. And that's kind of the, how they determine whether or not that dog is too tall, too short, you know, is it the legs are too short and the body's too long? Well, then it's out of proportion and it's going to get knocked down. If it's a nice square dog, it doesn't matter what height it is, if that makes sense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. If I'm doing it right, it should be the same as what the standard says. I shouldn't have any um, any preferences, and there shouldn't be preferences as far as what we breed. We should always just breed as close to the standard as we can. But that's hard to not have your own preferences. Um, I see certain weaknesses in the breed or certain trends, and I try to do better in my program that way. So. Um, like for me, a really good front is important. Um, there's a lot of fronts that are very, very straight. That's something that's been in the breed, you know, a long time. And so, um, you know, I, I try to have a better front in my dogs. Um, a great breeder had mentioned one time that that is something that is recessive. So if that's something that I can, you know, solidify as much as possible, that's something that I can move forward and and hopefully count on in, in, um, future breedings um disposition is definitely um you know a, a big big thing as, as far as what i want in my breeding program because if you this is a companion dog this is not you know like a, a kennel type dog so you want to have a dog in your house that you can get along with really well you know they've got to get along with each other they can't be you know, bonkers over things. They can't be too reactive to things. I mean, they should be easygoing. They should get along with each other. They, you know, should be a good all around, um, um, nice dog to have around with, you know, your, your kids, your people visiting, um, you know, and with other dogs. So that's one thing that I, that I really watch is if I can't live with that dog, I don't want it in my breeding program because it's, you know, it's, um, that's, that's not what I, that's not what I want to produce. Um, I like a typey dog. Um, I like the nice big round eyes. Um, I like a flat nose, but I, I don't like an extreme face. And that's not to say I haven't had a range of all different, you know, types of heads over the years. Um, but I like a, I like that classic Boston head. I like the big round eyes. Um, you know, I, I, I do like a short nose, but I am very, um, very aware of the breathing issues and I'm not going to breed a smashy face to a smashy face unless they have fantastic um, airways. If I've got one that's lacking a little in that area, I'm going to go to a good airway rather than go to the extreme face. Um, and I, I tell people, you know, I'm my breeding program is a work in progress. I, I'm not done yet. You're never done breeding, but um, I see certain things in the dogs that I've held back and I see things that are that are very strong that I want to solidify in my program. So, you know, I may overlook some other things and figure, okay, well, I'm going to fix that in the next generation. But this is what I want and this is what's hard to get. And so I'm going to keep this on this bitch or on this stud, um, you know, in order to try and solidify that. So I've, um, maybe I'm taking the long way around sometimes. I don't, you know, as people just go out and, and, um, and just, you know, completely call something that's that's not um you know as close to perfect as what they think it should be um but i you know i maybe take a little bit longer and try to solidify something so then in the future i can count on certain traits in my dogs um and hopefully can you know continue that um and with this breed it's it's so varied as far as the size, I've got one that's, you know, a cute little 13-pound 
uh, bitch and, and she's, you know, she's got great type. She's a, she's a nice looking little girl. And then I've, I've got this one that's this male that's 24 pounds that I absolutely love. So it's, um, the breed itself is, there's a wide variety of size, although the type should remain the same. You know, it's, um, it can be quite a range. You're not going to get these cookie cutter dogs. And, and that's one thing with the breed in general um, is we do have an issue with consistency. Um, despite the fact that they were able to keep the breed consistent for so many years and to to help kind of pin down the type in the first 20 years, um, here we are, you know, a century later and you can still breed you know, two dogs and come up with something, you go, where the heck did that come from? That looks nothing like either parent. It still happens. So, um, you know, we're, we're always battling that and always trying to get that consistency. And I don't know if it's because it's, you know, so much, uh, but it's a young breed. I mean, compared to, you know, like a, a poodle, which has got, you know, centuries behind it of consistent breeding, you've got something, you know, the Boston is hundred years old and, and has quite a range of, sizes and has quite a varied background um you know as far as their origin so it's it's sometimes very interesting to, <laughs> to come up with something that that just um is not what you're expecting um but uh that, that's just part of that's just part of the breed is there much difference in say the kennel club in the uk and the fci and standards um well it's it's interesting that you see uh, sometimes you see a certain type overseas now of course right now in certain countries they're pushing for the longer noses so um you go to germany and the judges are awarding um bigger dogs with more tail with with longer noses um and what's frustrating and i know it's frustrating for some of the breeders over there is that they're just kind of doing this despite the fact that the btca is you know this is where the breed originated this is the standard for the dog it should be what every country uses worldwide because that is the boston terrier um in some countries they're kind of um some are interpreting it different or or not so much interpreting but just taking it to a different place because of the push um, for the longer nose brackies. So um, even though the, the, you know, standard doesn't say it's, um, you know, a longer nose, they may award a longer nose, which pushes the breeders to breed a longer nose more to be able to get the titles on their dogs, which is, um, in my opinion, it's a little screwed up. <laughs> um, in some of the other, um, some of the other standards overseas, it will say, that the nose needs to be a minimum of one third the length of uh, of the skull, and in the AKC and the BTCA standard, it is um, it is no more than one third um, of the skull. So, right there, we've got a tweak in the standard that is changing the breed itself in certain areas overseas. So. That's a little frustrating because you can breed a very, very good airway um, in a Boston. You can breed good nares. You can breed, um, you know, a, a, you can breed out the narrow tracheas, which we don't have that much of a problem with, like like other breeds. Um, you know, the elongated soft palates. You breed that out. You can breed a nice clean neck and a, and a nice airway without making that nose longer. It's it's really just a superficial. Uh, what they consider a fix when it's actually not a fix so that can be a little bit frustrating I, you know i a lot of us have performance dogs dogs that do fast cat um dogs that do agility um and run absolutely fine with perfectly flat faces and then you can have these long-nosed bostons that still have to have nair surgery or they still have to have surgery for elongated soft palate so um you know, it is a little frustrating that you see some of these changes overseas that really are not necessary when the dogs are well bred. Um, as, as far as type in general, outside of that push for the longer nose, um, I tend to see a lot of over white dogs overseas um, in Europe, um, like the white coming up the back legs. So you, you know, they're probably 
more likely to get some white headed puppies or partially white headed puppies or just overmarked puppies. Um, you see a lot of overangulation overseas and, and I don't know if it's because of this, but you see a lot of people running their Boston's around the ring when actually you should be able to just do a fast walk with your Boston when you're showing it. That's, that's the, the speed that they should be gated at, but you see a lot of people running their dogs and that it could possibly because they're so overangulated in the rear, they've got to get them out and moving to kind of cover up the fact that they maybe don't move right with, with all that extra going on behind. Um, I do sometimes see heads that don't have that same Boston type that a lot of them have here in the U S. Um, we see a lot of down noses, um, in Europe, um, and that's not to say everybody, that's just to say I, I tend to see a few more of the smaller eyes, you know, the lower noses, um, just not the same expression in, in some of the dogs over there. Um, but then there are many, you know, breeding programs that are doing a very good job of, you know, keeping the type consistent with what we have here in the U.S. Yeah. I've seen that in other breeds, and honestly, I'm, I'm pretty disgusted by it because what I see are people that are focused on making a nose long and they they don't look at the rest of the dog as far as confirmation and you'll see these dogs that are just a confirmational mess and these people get applauded for making a, a longer nose and it's like my gosh this dog is going to have you know spinal issues or it's or it's going to have luxating patellas or something because they completely forgot the rest of the dog um in pursuit of a of a long nose so i i've seen just some confirmational wrecks as a result of this so um i i'm really hoping that it's not happening in the boston i don't see very much of that but you you do tend to see a lot of the longer noses in the disqualified colors um and what we have found has happened in a lot of cases is you've got um, people that have mixed in other breeds in order to get the color um, when something is very marketable and very profitable of course like any fad um, some people take shortcuts that's not to say everybody did or not to say that people are, are even aware that it's back there but um, you know you, you know for a fact that there were profit motivated breeders who just went well I can you know breed my gigantic blue or red pit bull to a Boston I can get the same markings I can get a nice big litter I can get it free whelped um, and I can get the color immediately um, the, so what you find a lot of times is is the bosses that have that are off colored or that have that in the background you see a lot longer noses you see the the floppy ears uh, we're seeing a lot of tails which, you know, the tail was bred out a long time ago, and now we're seeing Bostons with tails. And even in rescues 20 years ago, you didn't see tailed Bostons with long noses and floppy ears. So there's, unfortunately, there's been a change in type with with the more backyard bred Bostons. Um, there's There seems to be um, a wider and wider gap as far as the type between the two, and you go on a forum and and somebody will take a dog that's that's clearly a mix or you know it's got to have something in there hey it's you know it's 45 pounds it has a long nose it's got floppy ears it's got a long tail but it's got the correct markings hey is this a boston everybody goes oh yeah yeah that's a throwback yeah that's a boston well you know we didn't have bostons that look like that 20 years ago um so there's there's really been a shift in the breed and and so you do see the longer noses um and a lot of Breeders are, will say, well, I'm breeding a longer nose because it's better for breathing, um, which, you know, not necessarily true. I've seen long noses that have had to have surgery. So, um, you know, kind of within that, that group, you see changes in the breed. Um, but typically people will say I'm breeding longer noses because that's what they have you don't see too many people taking the short nose bosses and saying i think i need to elongate this nose on these dogs to make them healthier it's usually well this is what i already have and so this is what i like about them and this is you know what i'm going to continue with if that makes sense mm -hmm. can you talk about the colors of the boston and what's standard and what's out of standard 
Yeah, the the standard um, is black and white, brindle and white, um, and seal and white. And you can also have like black with brindle, which like in a boxer would be called a reverse brindle. Um, or you can have seal with brindle. So you can have, you know, a pretty dark, almost solid dog and have a few little brindle stripes and that's acceptable as well. So you can kind of mix between those, those three colors. Different. Um, back when the, the breed first started, uh, the first standard said all colors, semicolon, brindle, and then it, it described the markings. Um, there's some, um, controversy apparently on whether or not it meant any color brindle and if that semicolon was actually supposed to be there um or if it was any color and then it said brindle evenly marked with white so there is some confusion there but at the beginning there were other colors there were blue there was blue there was red or or liver and blue they called mouse um and uh there there was what they called buckskin, whether that's fawn or whether that's cream, I'm not sure. It's just, you know, kind of a light color. But originally, it was brindle only. There was no black. There was no seal. Um, it was just brindle. Um, once they once they changed that, at the very beginning, it was any color. And then brindle remarked was what they wanted. Um, and then they said it was just brindle. That was it. Um, then eventually... It was probably, I don't know, 30, 40 years later, they said, okay, well, you know, black is allowed as well. What they found is you breed brindle to brindle too long and you're going to get washed out. And so they had to bring the black in to keep the brindles um, a rich color. Yeah. Um, and what they find is, as well as they were just, they were also getting black. So um, it, it just needed to be part of the breed. And eventually they... Um, they separated out seal. It's not that seal wasn't um, accepted. It's just that seal was kind of a part of black. Um, so you take a, a black looking dog out in the sunlight and you get a little bit of that red tint, mm-hmm. you know, otherwise it looks black. Well, that's, that's your seal. So um, they basically just further defined, you know, the difference between black and seal when they allowed seal in. Um, so, there, there were very few colors as far as, um, you know, what, what anybody heard about or, or knew about over the years until about 2005, roughly, maybe 2004. And all of a sudden, there was a big color fad. You, you suddenly saw a ton of red Bostons um, and then the blue Bostons after that and then the fawn Bostons. And it was... Um, they sold very well. Um, it was it was a big, you know, kind of a money making fad for some breeders. Um, some were very excited about this because it was something new. It was different, and I think a lot of breeders at the beginning were under the impression that the colors were going to be accepted into the Boston Terrier because though there were so many, there's all these new breeders. Now we can, you know, you can um, color test and and breed for specific colors. So there was there was kind of this big boom of colored Bostons. Um, within that, um, there was clearly some mixing going on. I, I saw a lot of these early Bostons that they did not look Boston. There was, you know, clearly Frenchie mixed in, uh, Pitbull, um, uh, Chihuahua in some cases. You can you could just see the characteristics of the different breeds depending on what color it was. So um, even though some of the colors can naturally happen, for them to happen in that um, volume all at once was not possible. Um, and so unfortunately, you know, here we are 15 years later, there's no telling what and where the color came from and whether or not that was naturally occurring, whether it was added in. Um, so it's it's been very frustrating, I think, for the preservation breeders to see the changes in breed type to see these characteristics of other boss or, or of other breeds within our breed in the pursuit of color. Um, when you base a, a breeding program off of a marketable color, you're picking your puppies at birth from color as well. So as far as confirmation, as far as health, as far as 
disposition, a lot of those things suffered under breeders that had that color focus. Um, so it's, it's been frustrating. Um, you know, I don't think, um, most of these breeders really intended anything negative for the breed. You know, they, they love the the Boston's just like anybody else. Um, they're excited about the colors. They, they probably didn't know what they were up against as far as trying to get the BTCA to change the standard. That's, that's not going to happen for color. Um, they're very, very, uh, um, committed to keeping the Boston, um, you know, the, the way it's been for the last, you know, century. And so you're not going to see them giving in to adding the colors in, especially when there's been such a shift in type and in quality um, with the color population coming in. But, um, you know, it's it's not going to happen. And it's, it's, it's unfortunate for some people that were really excited to for them to be accepted and to be showing them and to, you know, see this big change and be, you know, kind of be on the forefront of something really new when, you know, I think unfortunately a lot of them were, were sold a line as far as that goes, um, uh, you know, for something that just wasn't going to happen. Um, yes. Um, like I mentioned before, the, ju- the juvenile hereditary cataracts uh-huh. or JHC, um, that's the most common test that that is done with, all breeders um and part of that is because it is a it's a convenient mail-in test you do the you know the cheek swab and you mail it and you get your results um it's very easy for every breeder to do um it's it's very important because we um that's something that popped up in in the breeder actually it was i don't think it popped up in the breed i think it was just in the breed for so many years until they finally weren't were able to get a test for it and then you know thank heavens they could finally have a way to eradicate it and now jhc um in most cases you just you don't hear about um affected dogs anymore at least as as far as show dogs what i hear you know you don't hear about affected dogs there is the occasional carrier that someone might use in a breeding program but they're used very very carefully um so um, you know, that's, that's something, thankfully, that's a, that's a big improvement and a very important test. Um, and then the care test, or it used to be called surf test, um, you know, that is an annual eye exam. And with, with the cataract issue with the Boston's, it also checks for several other um, problems as well. So that's something that a lot of the, the typical breeders, you know, non-show breeders will skip because they think JHC covers all cataracts or that that's, that's the eye test that they need to do. This is something annually that, that checks um, for other types of cataracts. Um, there's um, And also checks the progress of it. So if you've got um, a dog that's three years old and, and they're getting these, these cataracts that are, you know, progressing at a, at a, you know, very quick rate and the dog is, you know, going to be blind by the time it's six. Well, that's useful information to have in your breeding program. You don't, you don't want to be breeding um, those lines if that's what's happening. Um, if you've got a dog that is seven, eight, nine years old and they still have clear eyes, that's fantastic. That's what you want to keep in your breeding program. Um, anything over seven that is still has clear eyes is great um, with the Boston Terrier. I mean, you've got a 10 year old with clear eyes and that's that is gold right there i mean you, you, that's something that you want to keep in your program so that it's really important information for you to have um and very important for you to continue checking because if you you know if you're breeding this dog and it's three and all of a sudden these you know cataracts crop up and they're you know uh, rapidly um growing you definitely want to screen that out um and then with, uh, um, and then uh, bear testing is um, for deafness in the Boston Terrier, which is suspected to come from the English White Terrier. Um, the, there's the theory that there's two different kinds of deafness. Now, there isn't enough information to really tell one way or the other. However, with a lot of breeds, if there's too much white on the head, um, then the inside of the ears do not develop properly. The, the sound conducting hairs in the inside of the ears, if they don't have pigment and they die off, that can cause the dog to be deaf by the time it's about six weeks old. Um, so you want to watch the blue eyes and the excessive white on the heads. Um, and so testing your excessive, you know, your overmarked 
Boston's is very important, but there's also, you know, deafness in dogs that are perfectly marked that have perfectly marked dogs, you know, for five generations back, no blue eyes, nothing like that, no excess white. So, um, you know, there's a theory that we've got also, you know, a hereditary deafness that is unrelated to marking. So, um, it's very important that you're, you're checking all of your breeding dogs, bear testing them to make sure that you're not passing on a hereditary, um, issue as well. Um, as, as far as deafness and then uh, the patella check is very important to have the patellas out with aid um, and you want to have those periodically done because if you you know if you're great at a year but then at, you know three or four years old they're slipping not as not as solid then you know that's good information to have as well and you may want to take that dog out of the breeding program um, so that's that's the bare minimum so um, as far as getting your chick from OFA um, that's that's what you're going to want to have done. Um, beyond that, um, the uh, cardiac testing is important as well because there are um, some heart issues with the Boston breed. So you, you want to know if you're getting any uh, murmurs uh, cropping up in your dogs. Um, also, you can do trachea and spine. Uh, we don't have as many issues as, say, the um, the French Bulldog or, or other breeds. Um, so you typically don't find too many issues with that, um, but that's additional testing that you can do. I mean, of course, there's, you know, you can do hips, even though hips typically aren't an issue. So you can continue on with, with additional testing, but um, those four are the main. Um, I add on, you know, the heart as well um, in my breeding program. And then um, for some really weird reason, DM popped up. Um, as an issue in the Boston and uh, that's a whole other story but it's actually not an issue in the Boston it was added on by a bunch of the testing labs to um, to over 100 breeds Um, and it's been quite a money maker but it's not something that is actually an issue in the Boston Terrier breeds but you'll see a lot of um, a lot of the non-show breeders doing dm testing um also for some reason huu is coming up and again not an issue in the boston terrier but for some reason it's popping up with the labs that are doing the swab testing as a boston terrier issue so you'll see these things tested for as well but it's really not a problem in the breed and it's kind of um kind of odd to see them popping up saying I'm testing for this, this, and this, but not for the main things that they really should be testing for. Um, but the swab tests are very, very easy. The other ones require, you know, um, finding specialists and, and it's a lot more research and sometimes a lot of driving, um, sometimes it's hours away you know, that you're going to be able to find a specialist to do bear testing or care testing. So, you know, I understand it is a little bit more difficult to do that, but, um, you know, that's, that's kind of the breakdown of what you see as far as the testing and what's actually important as, as far as testing in the breed. Right. Um, I'm fast cat. I'd like to get into some of the others, but I quite honestly with, with running a business, I haven't had a whole lot of time to do any other training. Um, not a whole lot of training is required to get my dog to run after something in the grass. So that, <laughs> that was easy. Um, but I did have a, a male that I titled in Bass Cat. And, and right now I think I've only got one other that really has that, um, that drive where they, where they're going to want to chase something. I think the, you know, the rest of mine, I'm not sure that they would go after, <laughs> um, that quite as readily as, as these others. Um, but, um, and, and interestingly enough, um, the the one that I had titled and the other one that I feel would do really well at it, um, they're out of the same dam that kind of has that that has that drive, you know. So it's I, it's it's in the lines I think I'm wanting to I'm wanting to chase after something. But um, you know, I'd I'd like to do some more fast cat with them. I'd love to do you know some. Uh, barn hunt um i have no pool so i have no ability to practice for dog diving <laughs> um but but i'd love to get into the barn hunt and, and do some more um fast cat and, and lure coursing with with mine so um I, I don't know that i have the time to do as much training as required you know for agility and things like that but there's there's a lot of breeders that i know that that do that there's a breeder um down in the tri-city area that actually has a um 
and I, and I hope I don't get this wrong, but her dog is one of, one of the first ones to be certified in uh, Schutzhund oh, wow. um, performance. Yeah, it's it's pretty cool um, to see her to see her dog do that. It's, you know, it's, um, it's pretty neat. So you know, there's there's a lot that they can do, um, but we're usually, I think, being a, a companion dog. A lot of us are just you know, content with doing the confirmation, mm-hmm. but there's a lot more that they can if we just take the time to, to get out there with them and do it. Yeah. Yeah. They're right on it. They're, they're always ready to play. Yeah. Always ready to go after something. If you want them to, I, I've had some lazier than others. Um, mm-hmm. but, uh, I, I love the ones that just go nuts for the tennis balls yeah. or, or, you know, just, I had, um, I had one that I could hang a balloon from the ceiling and he just, I'd have to, you know, take it down or pop it or something to get him to stop. But he, he would just jump over and over going after this balloon. And that was, you know, it's, I don't know, they're, they're just such clowns. They're so much fun. Um, well, that's, that's another interesting topic with these breeds or with this breed. And, and I'm one of the few that has uh, free whelping lines. Um, my foundation girls, even, even the show lines from, um, Marsh Terry was, they were free whelping lines. Um, and so I have a lot of free whelpers. In fact, most of mine are from those lines. Um, but with the breed itself, you always have to be ready for a C-section. I still have, you know, sections periodically and I'm always ready for them. And I'm, I'm always willing to take them right in if I have any doubts at all. Um, but I am someone who is willing to let them try um, a lot of breeders now, especially in the U.S., will not let them try because um, the litters are small, um, which a lot of times will make the puppies big, um, and you can lose a puppy in whelping. So when you've only got maybe three puppies and um, you know, and you're risking losing one of them in the whelping process if you're not sure the bitch has the ability to free whelp, you know, that's a very scary thing. And, and I don't blame anybody for taking their dogs in and doing a section voluntarily. Um, the only time I've ever lost a bitch has been during a section. And so, of course, that that scares me because I, I you know, I've never lost one in free whelping. Uh, you know, they they have their babies. They're, they're perky afterwards. They're energetic. They're great moms when they've been able to do it on their own. You don't have to worry about them, you know taking their baby's heads off because they're still loopy from from the anesthesia and and there's just the recovery is so much faster they don't you know they don't have to heal up it's um it's just in my opinion it is so much better if they can but i but i don't blame anybody for not doing it now in europe um in some countries, I believe it's in Germany, if you've got one that has, that has to have a section, if it has to go in and have a section again, you don't get to, to register any puppies out of that Boston anymore because um, they feel that should be removed from the breeding program. Um, a lot of people do free whelp over there. It's something that is a lot more um, valued there than it is here. And um, the Honestly, personally, I wish that weren't the case. I think it's something that's very important to keep in our dogs. Um, I think that a, you know, free whelping, a good sized litter is, I, I think that's an indication of a, of a healthy breed. Um, and so it's, I, I do feel like we're kind of going down this road of, you know, these small litters, big puppies, C-section every time. I don't think it's good, but it is something that most breeders are willing to do. A lot of breeders have never even attempted to, to free whelp. Um, you know, they're, they're afraid to, you know, I don't, I don't blame them. Um, and so some just have never have, they've never tried. Um, and they, you know, some people will say, well, you just take a, you know, a big bitch and you breed it to a smaller male or you just breed smaller heads or you just do X, Y, Z and, and you're going to fix the problem. But um, they did a study and um, the the free whelping bitches have a different shaped pelvic opening. It is a big round opening versus more of an oval opening. So if, if you've got a line of dogs that doesn't have that, that, sh- that, that certain shape, um, of the pelvic opening, then 
um, you are going to have dogs that need dissection. And, and when you have limited feeding pool, when somebody has, you know, maybe bred for years and, and here they've got these, you know, wonderful examples of the breed, you know, are you going to take those dogs and take them out of your breeding program after all that work? Um, because they've got to have sections. Um, you know, it's, I understand that this, this is something that is being bred into the breed and way it's not necessarily great. I understand why people don't just want to, you know, scrap really nice dogs just because they can't free whelp. And, and sometimes, you know, labor does stop. Sometimes they have issues that are not just related to, you know, physically not being able to pass the puppy. Um, so it's, you know, it's a little bit more of a, a tricky breed as far as whelping. I mean, I, I love the fact that most of mine can free whelp still, um, you know, and, and sometimes I get crap for it because, <laughs> because people feel it's interesting with other breeds when, when people with certain breeds have sections all the time, they're like, Oh my gosh, I can't believe you do that to your bitches. And that's, it's horrible. And you're, you know, you're so awful to them. But then within the, within the Boston breed, you, you let them try to free whelp and it's, Oh my gosh, I can't believe you do that to your bitches. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a, it's a different mindset within the breed is it's, it's become so um, commonplace that not doing it, a lot of times people say, oh, were you being cheap by not going have, and having a section? If I want to go have a planned section, I have a very reasonably priced vet that is very, very good at doing sections. And it costs me a lot less to plan one um, than it is to allow them to try and free whelp and then have to run into the e-vet in the middle of the night um, and pay them for a section versus my own vet. So trying sometimes will cost me three or four times as much. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it's, it's for me, it's, it's definitely not about money. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, I had, um, I had a bitch last year that is, um, you know, like borderline record breaking. Uh, she, she is a grand champion herself. We're working on her bronze right now. So from show lines, you know, a lot of times you'll see from backyard lines, you'll see a lot of free whelping, you know, big Bostons that don't have a problem. They have nice big litters, but in show lines, it's very rare. This, this, uh, bitch of mine had 11 puppies free whelped last year and every single one of them was healthy, happy, thrived. Um, you, there was only that I could find. There was only one other in show lines that had ever done that. Um, that was back in the eighties. There was another one that was show lines on the top. Um, you know, not so much on the bottom, you know, they had a similar litter a couple of years ago, but otherwise it's, it's practically unheard of. And, and, um, I, I had one breeder went, you know, publicly on social media talking about how horrible I was to, um, to allow my girl to free whelp these puppies. And she had them probably, those 11 puppies, it was, uh, most of them were within probably six or seven hours. I mean, she was just boom, 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 like it was nothing. And then the last couple, she took a little bit longer with, you know, she laid down, relaxed a little bit, popped up, had another one. Um, so it was it was all very textbook they were healthy all the puppies thrived she didn't have any issues she popped up and you know had all sorts of energy afterwards wonderful mom um but you know still there was the why didn't she just go in and have a section that poor you know that poor girl having all that puppies well or all those puppies well you know, she didn't have to heal up her poor gigantic stomach, you know, didn't have to heal up from a section. She didn't have to wake up woozy and figure out what all these little squirming things were. I mean, it was, it was a perfect delivery, as perfect as I could possibly get. Um, so it's, it's very interesting, the different attitudes between, um, but, uh, you know, between different breeds and, and within the breed as, as far as how free whelping is viewed and, and, you know, I, my attitude towards it, I think is a little bit different toward, you know, than a lot of breeders.